the record button at the bottom. Okay, I see the icon there. All right, uh, I'm gonna mute my mic and then you can get started whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hi folks, we'll just give it another minute and see if anyone else joins us here and then we'll get started. I'm Chitra Kumar from the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group and we'll be monitoring your group and uh, fielding some questions on the, if you're gonna use the chat box. Just a reminder to keep yourself on mute unless you're gonna jump in and ask a question. Appreciate that. All right, a few more dings here, so we'll just give it 30 more seconds. All right, why don't we go ahead and hand it over to the panelists. Deb Thanks. Kelly, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Thanks, Titra. Um, I'm just gonna kick us off by uh, setting a few objectives for this time um, and, and really appreciate you all joining. Um, as Janet said at the beginning of the uh, first hour, this is really the open discussion hour, uh, the time um, to do three things, I think. One is to give you an idea, an opportunity to dig deeper into some of the things that, that we shared before. I do have the PowerPoint that had our slides um, up on a screen here. I'm not gonna bring it up unless there's a, a, a real reason to, so we can actually see each other. Um, but I'm happy to do that if we need it. Um, but we wanna give you an opportunity to raise some questions, challenge the assumptions or the the analysis um, of, of what the gaps and the assets are and, and some of the benefits we see of investing more catalytic capital in your community. So we wanna have, create this space to just talk a little bit more deeply about some of these ideas. We're also really uh, wanna use this space to give you a chance to share ways that you're investing catalytic capital in your community right now, both dollars, but as Kelly said, other kinds of philanthropic capital and give you all a chance to, to talk with each other about some of the things that you're doing. And finally, we want to create the space at least to talk about any of the challenges or opportunities you might be facing as you step into a role in economic development and um, local investing of your capitals in the community so that you can seek insights from each other. Um, you have with um, Kelly and Bonnie, two very experienced community foundation practitioners who've been doing this work uh, for a long time. Um, we, I at Locus work with a lot of community foundations across the country, so I'm happy to chime in based on that experience too. Um, Chitra, I, I, I'm not sure from your perspective, we've been using the chat box to um, post questions and things mm -hmm. like that. We don't have a huge group, so I think if you um, if you want to put in the chat box that you have a question you want to raise, maybe we could call on you and have you um, sort of speak it out, if that makes sense. Um, that sounds great. Okay. Whatever people's so, comfort level is. I'm going to throw it open. Please, um, please feel free to use the chat box and say I've got something that I'd like to share or a question. Um, and I also, as we're waiting for folks to do that, Kelly and Bonnie, if there's anything that you didn't get a chance to share since we had a pretty tight uh, time frame to share our big idea, um, I wanna just um, give you that opportunity while folks have a chance to pose any questions or, or again, challenge our assumptions, um, speak about how you how this all settled with, with you all and your lived experience. So I, I do want to just point out a couple of things. Um, when we started our, our uh, revolving loan fund, we then um, 
utilized a portion of the money that we received back to hire our local economic alliance to be the, the um, first line in looking at new opportunities to do loans because they're the frontline workers. The community foundation certainly isn't in the business of being an economic development practitioner. Um, we already have that in our community. So we felt it was prudent for us to help them pay for the work that they have such a hard time doing, right? Finding those, those dollars um, for administrative costs is pretty tough. So we hired them to actually administer that. Um, and then we also then, um, utilized a CDFI to be the, um, the, the organization to look at the loan once it came in to make sure that it really did have a, 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 it was a niche opportunity, it met our mission, all of the things that Kelly spoke about that's so important in impact investing. After we did the micro loans, and I'm sitting at my desk at home in my office, like all of us are, and I've had more time to reflect based on the fact that I don't have staff knocking on my door all day, every day, um, or people from the community just walking in the office and chatting. I've had a lot more time to think, and one of the things I thought about is I'm sitting on over $40 million in assets. And we are investing a significant portion, almost all of that, in New York firms. Why are we not, if the money was, was actually earned in our local community, why are we not taking a portion of that, um, those dollars that donors have given to us and reinvesting it? Why aren't we using that capital twice? I can use it for grant making and for local investing all at the same time. And so I reached out to my friend Deb Markley and Travis Green and said, what can you do to teach my board and do board engagement? Um, we do every single board meeting, I have 20 minutes of board education. And so I invited Deb and Travis to do board education um, last month and sent out some pre-information homework for my board to read about um, impact, true impact investing not the kind that we've been in, which is all of the dollars that we used for our revolving loan fund was separately invested and not counted as part of our investment pool. Why am I so afraid about investing in my local community? Why were we so afraid? And so Deb and Travis did such a phenomenal job of doing and explaining to my, my board and the fact that we'd already stepped our toe into the work. Um, so we already had a committee in place to be the first line to look at it. Northern Initiative, you heard Dennis West, he now has a CDFI that, that reaches all across our state. So we have this incredibly brilliant organization that can do the due diligence for us and, and take that pressure away from us. And we also have all these community partners that love and trust the Community Foundation. So utilizing all the capitals of of, of our trust and our social capital and our intellectual capitals and all the other capitals, put it all together. And my board just voted to go forward and move forward with Deb and Travis to move into a more robust impact investment model. And the, the only thing I've heard from the partners in our community is why did we not do this sooner? Um, so I said, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 50 years ago. Let's do it today. So I just wanted to share that with you um, because I think it's important to, to think about ways we can continue to build the capacity of, of building community. And, and Bonnie, Bill, and, and Kelly, for you as well, Bill Menner asked this question, which you, you, you started to, um, to touch on, talking about the process of making your boards comfortable with this, with the, the the perception of the risk that's involved in it, as well as, as your donors. And I wonder, Kelly, if you might speak a little bit to your experience with Encourage and getting your board and your donors. And then Bonnie, if you have some more to add. And I do, we also then have an example that Eli put up that we'll get to in a minute, but. Sure. Um, well, one, 
the one example I referred to uh, in the opening session was um, research that's done by others that you can share then with your board and or donors. And one real contemporary piece is from early April, and we can get this link out to you from Carsey Institute um, that uh, uh, partnered with Seattle Foundation and Grand Rapids Foundation to assess donor interest in community investment. And it was a, a very robust piece of research and it came back and said nearly 20% of donors would choose to invest in their community if they had the option. Um, so there's a piece of data and I always think data or demonstrated example of you know elsewhere is good for local boards who may not have that context. Um, the other thing that was useful to us, and this was quite a while ago, um, uh, and uh, our story was the sale of a Fortune 500 company that was headquartered in central Wisconsin that resulted in 40% job loss for the region. So it was economic crisis, um, but also cultural crisis of being dependent on a single industry. And it was that crisis that um, I, I believe you gave us permission and the board, the, um, the appetite uh, to consider just about anything uh, to help support the community. And could we, what else could we do? Um, and our first foray, foray was to step into a CDFI investment. One thing we found very useful, and it still is useful today, is uh, it's on the Heron uh, Foundation's website. And that is where I'm doing a fellowship right now. It was authored in 2006 by the former board chair, Bill Deedle, and it was titled Mission Stewardship, Aligning Programs, Investments uh, to Achieve Mission. And in it, it cited um, a, a court ruling in New York uh, around a board of education that said fidelity to mission is a primary responsibility of boards of directors. And so um, looking at financial investment and fiduciary responsibility from the lens of mission, fidelity to mission, um, is that really served as a platform of good information, national example, and that yes, we, we do have a, a responsibility to, um, to fidelity to our own mission. Last thing is experiential learning and mo motivating new behavior by having boards see that others have done it, whether it's, it, and oftentimes it's baby steps to step in um, and see that you know, your, your peer community foundation in, uh, in Bonnie's world did X, Y, and Z, and this is what happens. And I think that's what behooves all of us to capture and share stories. And I will add that um, on that note from Kelly, because that was a great segue. Uh, what I do on a regular basis is when I hear an inspirational story and, and I can see that that particular CEO or colleague, oh, look at the baby. <laughs> the CEO or the colleague is such a great, um, can, can really tell the story well because it's their story. I invite them to come to the meeting, whether it's by phone or by Zoom or whatever, but they tell the story, they tell the inspiration, and, and that really resonates with, because my board's like, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Great. Eli, do you wanna share what you're doing with COVID business recovery efforts in Appalachian, Ohio and West Virginia? Sure. Um, so I first uh, introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm Eli Flournoy, and I um, I represent essentially a family office uh, out of Athens, Ohio. Um, and we created my family created a company, a for profit company, but triple bottom line uh, impact investing company called Sugarbush Valley Impact Investments. Um, and we have been um, we're we're operating with a more of a, a community foundation mindset or an I guess I would say an economic development um, uh, mindset and so our uh, we have been working with a lot of um, a lot of partners foundations including um, Kara's Foundation for Appalachian Ohio um, the Athens County Foundation um, uh, and other regional um, place-based um, foundations 
to try and find a way to, to work together and to address exactly the questions that you guys have been talking about. And Bonnie, I want to say, you know, well done. It is, it, it's so exciting to hear that, that you've made that, uh, that step because those are exactly the questions that we keep hearing and that we ourselves have had over and over again is how, you know, we, we know that we want to do this. It doesn't make any sense to have all of our money invested in some far off, you know, um, place that's, that's, you know, maybe only coincidentally having some local impact, but probably, um, probably not. Um, uh, and the question is how to do it responsibly and what, what, what is the, the vehicle? So we, we, when we set up our company, we, uh, you know, we knew we wanted to do this. We knew we wanted to move uh, a portion of our invested funds uh, into local investments, but we didn't, we didn't want to do it by ourselves. Um, and so we formed, um, we formed a kind of informal group, which we call the Impact Innovation Group. Um, it's, uh, um, it's a group of, of uh, sort of Parkersburg area, west, uh, uh, western, uh, southwestern West Virginia, and um, southeastern Ohio. Um, based organizations and funders uh, and some um, some individuals, um, and originally we were um, we were very focused on stimulating the startup pipeline um, and supporting the um, uh, startup businesses and doing economic development like that. But once once COVID came in, we um, we pivoted right away to um, to look at all right how how do we um how do we support the existing businesses um uh right now and um so we um pretty quickly we um identified that we we needed uh we needed an entity that we could work with to um to how or entities that we could work with that could do the the responsible proper in um uh administrative work of um sam so we you know we figured out we wanted to do a loan fund, some sort of a loan fund, and some sort of a grant fund. So we we uh, um, have partnered together with uh, um, the local CDFI, which is called Appalachian Growth Capital, uh, in Nelsonville, Ohio, and uh, um, uh, and then we uh, um, uh, we've partnered with Rural Action, which is a, a local environmental nonprofit um, that I think many of you may be familiar with. Um, in uh, um, in the Athens area, and um, to we, so rural action is sort of the host of the the grant um, program, which is supposed to be launching um, uh, this week, which is targeted specifically towards uh, helping businesses get back to business as they start to reopen. So small grants, three thousand dollars or um, or less to uh, um, to to get the proper PPE or whatever it is that they need to do to put up, you know, plexiglass shields or these extra expenses that they didn't count on that will enable them to safely uh, resume um, operations of, of their businesses. And then we've been, um, we've been building a loan fund, uh, which is targeted to ideally be a zero or very low interest, um, a loan fund that will offer both term loans and uh, um, lines of credit. Uh, loans, which we intend to um, put it, we're we're about to launch fundraising for that. And my my company is sort of leading investor. We put a hundred thousand dollars into it as a um, as a lead investor um, into that. And sort of from our perspective as a as a for profit investment company, it was um, it sort of not only our economic development goals, our triple bottom line goals, but a, uh, but a cash management um, um, strategy during the you know, wild fluctuations of the, of the market and the economy overall. Um, and um, so we're about to start fundraising with that. And we're aiming for the uh, um, some, somewhere in the August to September range as we, um, as we kind of measure and look at the, at how the government programs, the PPP and the EIDL and some of the USDA programs that are now starting to uh, um, come out and EDA um, funds are, are starting to come into play. Uh, and we're looking for where the gaps are uh, and, uh, and see how we can strategically apply this, um, particularly as it 
relates to the, um, for the Athens area, this is an economy that is, um, is totally dependent on the on, on Ohio University uh, economic engine and the students um, uh, being physically on campus. So presuming that at least to some extent students will be able to return to campus, we're trying to, uh, um, we're trying to figure out the best way for the companies to, uh, for our local businesses to, to ramp back up, to manage their, their, um, their cash flow um, as they, you know, open up and it's safer and safer for them to, uh, to go back to, to full business. Great. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Eli. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to, um, one response to that, I think, to, just to emphasize the role of partnerships and, and I think about Bonnie's first investment and how many different funding partners there were in, in that. Um, the, the one question we get a lot, um, because there are places like, like Athens that are blessed to have a CDFI now, you didn't always have one, um, in, you know, just in the last couple of years, but um, we've been working with a lot of foundations in Kansas and in Indiana where there, there aren't community development financial institutions. And, in those in those places, folks are looking at relationships with community banks, you know, that may be able to do an affordable housing project in your downtown if they had a little bit of philanthropic capital that might be in a second or third loss position, might be a little cheaper capital. Um, so I, I think it's it's important to recognize the importance of partnership, but also that that partnership could be a credit union, it could be your local bank. Um, and or other institutions that exist there. Um, so one of the questions was, what was one of the, the most surprising discoveries in the rural urban research that, um, that Locus just finished up? Um, gosh, that's a, that's a good question. I think that um, one of the, so I'll, I'll share two things that I think were, um, were surprising. Um, just in line with the conversation we're having today, um, how often philanthropy was not at the table um, initially in some of the regional approaches to um, community challenges, that um, not there as an, as an economic development partner. They were there as a funding partner, you know, give, it, give us a grant to support this work but weren't viewed with the broad set of tools that I think uh, place-focused foundations and place-based foundations really can bring to the table. Um, so that was, for me, was interesting given the work that we're doing with place-based foundations right now and the important role I think they do have in stepping up to the economy, especially in a, in a challenging time um, as, as we have right now. Um, the other, surprising thing, and I, I'm not sure that surprising is quite the right word, but um, the regional collaborations that we looked at were, um, I would say for the most part, created a lot of impact, but it was also really, really hard work. And for those of you who are involved in collaborative activity, it, it, it doesn't just happen. It takes a lot of investment of your social capital, your reputational capital, to try to bring folks, as Inez said in her presentation, from this self-interest to a sense of common interest. Um, and, and so that was one of the, the challenges of doing that and funding it and finding the time and finding the, the organization that was going to sort of coordinate that. Um, I, I wonder, Kelly, whether you could just speak a little bit to because Encourage brought, put the community in that role of, of sort of um, creating that common vision that brought people together. And I wonder if you might speak a little bit to your work with Encourage and how that happened. Sure. Um, I was actually thinking about a question that was posed before we broke out um, oh, by someone, I don't recall who it was, but it, some, we, can, we could get to the question, but it was very relevant. Yeah. It was small emerging community foundation, yeah. a lot of discretionary resources, um, and uh, and focus on scholarship and administration. How do they 
how do they step into this kind of work um, was was the question yeah. um, but uh, I would say you know for early on we we just stepped out into the community and started having conversations and went to coffee shops and gas stations and sat down and had conversations outside of our walls and those conversations uh, led us to uh, to really reach out and ask the community, you know, what is it that you want from us? I would say this is in um, 2001, 2002, and uh, we were pretty traditional at the time, um, raising money, fundraising, and then grant making, and predominantly scholarships. And uh, the community said, we want you to create jobs. Um, and by the way, we think you're a little elite. Uh, mm -hmm. and so we took both of those things to heart and i will say it was the composition of our board at the time and what was their lived experience in that community did they did they have pain that resulted from the sale of the paper company did they so i do think there's something to be said for looking at the composition of the board and and their lived experience in in community but the communities told us we want you to start creating jobs um, there was not economic development infrastructure in the in place. It was all in service of this single company. So over a period of time, um, those kind of informal outreach grew into more formal uh, scheduled focus groups, community-based conversations. Um, we partnered with the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation through their Community Information Challenge for a number of years, and it ended up doing broad-based uh, community survey and outreach to every household in the region that we served to come up with a core set of priorities. And then we uh, work to align our investment portfolio around those priorities. So there's, there's a number of different um, uh, pieces of information or reports on that, but I do think it just starts by getting outside of the walls of the community foundation and going and having conversations and meeting people where they are and sometimes they don't expect you to be there and and i just put the link to the page that has all the results of the regional research uh that we just finished in in, in the in the chat box um i want to i see kara's question and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute but i want to i want to come to to the question that was put up in the um the q a before we got out of the first hour and Bonnie, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know I've heard you speak to how few discretionary resources you had when you got into the children's savings account work and the other things. And I wonder if you might speak to, you know, how does a emerging community foundation with really limited discretionary resources and a whole lot of stuff on their plate start to think about this bigger role and opportunity here? Well, if, if you could talk to my staff, they'd tell you it's because I'm absolutely crazy and I um, see something that inspires me and so I start doing it without thinking too hard about what's going to come after, right? Um, but what I will tell you is as, as you begin this work and you begin to do relevant, wonderful, impactful things for your community, people step up to the plate and want to help either financially or with their own capital of, of people. I mean, just the people capital that has come to bear, like with our children's savings account, which is a, a, a whole nother piece of impact. But our local community bank charges nothing to hold all of these children's savings accounts that are funded with $50. I mean, imagine going to a bank, a financial partner, and telling them, every year we're going to open 750 individual accounts with $50, and we expect you to administer that for free. Uh, doesn't happen, right? They just came to the table and said, this is an incredible way for us to do our um, community reinvest, to prove our community reinvestment as part of that CRA. And that's the whole piece, I think, now with this impact investing is that I don't want to go to my donors yet again and say, I need more money from you. If I redeploy the money they've already given me and I'm using that two times, 
with grant making and with impact investing, they're just going to want to reinvest again because I'm being prudent with that. And I'm also, you know, and you're also taking care of, of your community. But when it comes to the actual intellectual capital, I look for partners that have the pieces that I don't. How do I engage them and how can they be part of that? Like Eli talked about earlier, where are those CDFIs or the other types of partners, as Deb said, your, your banks or your credit unions that can provide the, the due diligence side of this because that's what they do. They're in the business of making loans. And they want to partner with us because the more capital we put into them, the more viable and strong they are. And the more viable and strong our local banks are, the more viable and strong our community is. I mean, it, we all just feed each other. And so don't be frightened of what kind of work it's gonna take for you. Think about the strengths that you have and then what are the assets in your community that already are there? They already exist and pull those partners in. So Kara posed this question and, and, and I'm going to pose it to the whole group because I want to make sure that there, there may be folks who are working in place-based philanthropy in places of persistent poverty. But the question was, what are the best examples of success in establishing and growing place-based philanthropy in rural areas with persistent poverty. And Kara, if, if you want to say something more around that, that would be, that'd be fine too. Um, I don't think really here yeah. to, I appreciate it in your talk talking about how some places we have to establish the philanthropy in order to deploy it. And I'm just looking yeah. to see what else might be out there. And any, any thoughts from the folks in the room? who might be working in places where you've had to address that before? Bonnie or Kelly? I mean, I'm, I'm happy so to- So while, while there ahead, is Bonnie. generational poverty, because I do, we have a lot of that in my local town. So in little tiny Hastings, we have um, about, 53% are Alice population. And, and that divide is growing all the time, right? But there are people that are very blessed that have the capacity to help. So I always felt like it was my job to help them understand how their investment could help lift the, lift the tide for all boats. And, and that collectively together, we can do that. And um, so we're just a 25 year old community foundation. We're very, very young. And that's a blessing and a curse. And the blessing is, I don't have this historic history of years and years and years of doing what community foundations always did. But it's also a curse in that you, you have to really focus on building assets before you can begin to do these types of things, right? But I will also tell you, the more you do this type of thing, the more relevant you become, the faster you grow, and it's, it's organic. You don't have to work as hard to grow. Kelly? Yeah, I, I, um, I think about, um, some colleagues, in particular, um, Black Belt Community Foundation uh, would be Felicia Lucky, um, and their their motto or byline has been taking what we have to make what we need. And years ago, we were in a peer learning uh, network with uh, Felicia and her board members, and multi generation, you know, multiple generations of poverty, but their their lens and their mindset and their approach was. Um, you know, we have wisdom, we have uh, assets. Um, and, and I do think, I, I see at a national level, there's um, uh, a, a growing interest in listening or paying attention to, it, it, even if it's lip service on the part of some, <laughs> excuse me, but there is, 
there is uh, a, a percolating statement around you know, growing the agency of communities or listening to the wisdom of communities. And if a community demonstrates agency, regardless of multiple generations of poverty, um, uh, then, then I think it's incumbent on us to call those that are making that statement and invite them to invest and partner. Um, so that's one. I think the other, you know, foundation for the Mid-South, um, and I also think um, uh, these are just come to mind for um, Northwest Area Foundation and um, some of the investments in, in that area um, have, have been very similar in terms of multi-generation. Yeah. yeah, that's very helpful. We were just coming from a context where you have 90% less charitable assets per capita in our part of the state than outside. We're about 20 years old. Uh, we were started with state government support, which is unusual. Uh, we ended up launching our own IPO, it was an initial philanthropic offering for the capital to raise $100 million, have been successful, got a state appropriation of $10 million last year to serve as match, have established 12 local foundations, um, but it's a continual challenge. And as I listen to all of this, one of the things that is sort of traditional in the community foundation is that relationship with the financial advisor. And so our partners in these community level uh, you know, across our 32 counties have really been financial planners. And so part of our portfolio, yes, working with our CDFI, but part of the community foundations and the way they've emerged traditionally has been around that more traditional financial planning, especially in a, in a um, context like ours, the financial advisor brings you the relationships, then they continue to manage those assets, even though they're become the community foundation. So this has been eye opening to me as I think about design principles around our investment policy of letting donors opt in or out um, in the future. Like it would be very difficult for us to reverse those relationships that are already in place. And we have made our, we made our first loan this year and learned a lot from it. Um, but thank you. I just, I'm just always looking for idea because in, a, in an area like ours, quite frankly, it's not convincing people to be entrepreneurial with their philanthropy. It's just getting the philanthropy, you know, there to do the work. So thanks for all this great, great ideas yeah good thank you um we have another question in the chat box about um one of the silver linings is that of COVID is that it opens the door to creativity and invention um while so many existing businesses are devastated there are new businesses that haven't started up yet does anyone have experience moving forward with a new initiative during this time and I assume that I that that was Donna. Donna, is there something more that you want to add to that? Um, uh, no, not not really. Um, we just are in a situation here where um, again we're in a very small place um, and um, have been building capacity over the last couple of years um, to really start moving forward with some um, entrepreneurs new entrepreneurship here in our area in a number of different areas um, and of course everything comes to a screeching halt with something like covid um, and yet um, and we also um, like someone else mentioned um, retooled an entrepreneurs fund to be able to do some lending um, some crisis lending to um, within our local community to the small businesses but um, the, the also you know as this has happened um, the need for it's it's revealed the need for some new businesses in our area and um as well as businesses that were um scheduled to um start opening for our summer season here um really are businesses some of them are businesses that are not particularly impacted by covid they're, they're not seasonal tourism businesses they're there are other things that are aren't don't have that much impact and yet the the impact has been that everybody's sort of um pulled up stakes for a while to um to hunker down and so we, you know i was looking for if anybody had any similar situations where they were able to move some things forward what were the key things that um, enabled them to do that any thoughts for donna um, this is, this is ahead, Paula. Paula Jensen with Dakota Resources. Um, 
So we also work with some entrepreneurs in our state and we also uh, work with economic development directors. And what we discovered um, was a lot of those entrepreneurs didn't need more debt. So our immediate um, response was to help them understand and to do a lot of the research be behind some of the programs that were available, like the PVP and the EIDL loan and different things um, that, that came to our, our awareness, right? So what we started doing is we were meeting on a daily basis on a virtual coffee break um, and just having conversations to help people discover how to work best remotely, how to access these funds. And it has really created um, a place for those folks to come. And I believe that that kind of technical assistance, so to speak, and connection to each other has helped move those businesses and those communities forward a lot faster than if they would not have had those connections. And there, we currently have a group of about six economic development professionals that are researching um, training tools through Google and other sources about helping get their businesses online. That seems to be a national problem. Um, I've, I've heard it from places all over the nation that not enough businesses have a, a recognition or a place online so that these folks are coming together to then drill down within their communities to get those businesses online during this time, which will be a lasting effect. So um, that's kind of the direction we've taken. Great, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, I would just add, add to that, Donna. I think that the, just the simple act of reaching out to the, the folks that you know were thinking about launching a new enterprise and checking in on them, connecting them to organizations like Dakota Resources or a small business development center to have those conversations. I mean, the kinds of things that Paul is talking about, you can do uh, without being face to face. To face. And, and I think we, we sometimes just forget <laughs> that just having a conversation and asking how somebody is doing and what would move them along and can we connect you to somebody is a really, is a really powerful, powerful thing. Um, yeah, we have um, like a situation with our co-op that for the last five years has really struggled. You know, we have um, uh, two parts of our population, the part, um, a smaller part that, um, has um, made include some of the summer people and some of the retirees that have lived other places and have um, a, a broader background and a, a better um, orientation to healthy living. And then we have a um, systemic poverty part of our population um, who you know would never even dream of setting foot in um, the co-op, um, but uh, because Walmart is the alternative for 60 miles. So, um, you know, the, um, um, when the COVID um, situation shutdown hit, um, Walmart ran out of food and people had to shop the co-op. Um, co so they developed a new, um, a new set of customers. Um, their downstate uh, New York um, suppliers weren't able to supply them with all of the organic food that they needed. However, in the North Country, um, all the restaurants were closed and the farmers up here um, needed an outlet for their food. So now they have new suppliers. Um, their sales are fivefold over what they were last year um, already to date. You know, there's a, a huge opportunity here um, that the co-op has embraced, although with a certain amount of guilt, like, you know, they feel like they're taking advantage of the misfortune around them and capitalizing on that to, to build their own organization, but it's what they needed. It, it's the catalyst that was needed to build that. And it's, it's in our downtown, which we're desperately, you know, trying to build back up. Um, it's removed from Walmart. It, it's, it's doing everything that it should have been able to do for the last five years. And it took the crisis to be able to um, instigate the change that it needed. So, yeah. Um, you know, silver linings. Yeah. Yep. Um, we had another question, Paula, I think raised this, this question. Um, 
often suggesting to funders that want to make a difference in rural areas. Oh, I'm sorry, that was the one of Kara's responses. Uh, sometimes philanthropy has a hard time understanding rural culture and capacity. What have you found the best way for rural organizations to help funders understand the unique needs? Um, and Kara offered um, suggesting that they not judge most the impact by dollars of dollars in terms of deals or number scale or number of people touched. Looking sideways in my my uh, bifocals aren't quite wor working. I apologize for that. Sorry, I didn't need to send that to everybody either. I've got to yeah. get better with Zoom. Um, <laughs> but I think it's it's a it is a good a really good response. We have to get away from the idea that unless you can touch a hundred million people it's not worth doing as national philanthropy. But Kelly, I wonder if, if you have something you'd like to share. I, I just have a comment on the um, uh, uh, Donna's comment about innovation and businesses, or maybe it wasn't Donna, I'm sorry, Paula, on businesses migrating and moving online. Um, they need broadband to be able to do that. And, and Eli brought that up you know, earlier. Um, and I just asked Chitra to uh, link in, I think, a really well-written and well-crafted uh, letter to uh, uh, federal elected officials from uh, Rural Development Innovation Group at Aspen. It's the group that's kind of supporting this webinar. Um, and in it, I think there are a number of really uh, well-composed talking points in particular about broadband that you might take yourself and use your intellectual, your reputational capital. So when we talk about more capitals than financial, you know, you might not have a lot of discretionary you know, resources, but we certainly all have uh, reputational capital that we can expend in terms of advocating for what we know we need. And I think which should be just a basic human right right now is, is access to broadband. When you have kids in rural communities that have to sit in the, the car outside in the Walmart parking lot to do homework. You know, that's the kind of story that contextualizes for urban funders, what is it like to live in rural America? It's not a level playing field. And I, I think the Rural Development and Innovation Group has been trying across a number of different sectors to, to identify these talking points. How do you make rural, um, real and relevant for policymakers out there and, and funders. Um, and, and I think that this, um, this moment in time that we're, that we're in with COVID, I think, um, and w where the issue of systemic racism has, has come up um, just so importantly in the, the last week or so, I think it's going to be important for folks to be able to define the, the, that range of issues across the rural urban spectrum. They, they are definitely felt and lived human issues for all of us, but things show up a little differently in rural places and being able to, to speak to that um, and have good, honest conversations, not only with national philanthropy, but within communities and between urban and rural neighbors um, is going to be critically important um, as, as we go forward. Yeah, so pa Paula just wrote about the um, broadband in South Dakota and um, one foundation, and I won't mention their name because I don't know whether this deal has gone through, but they were actually considering a loan to a a rural broadband so provider or to their broadband provider, private firm in their community to get rural, um, broad, rural homes in the county linked up because that company could have applied for a federal grant to do that. And sometime in the fall or winter, maybe the grant would have come through. The foundation could make the grant today and they, the company had promised that the homes would be hooked up before the, school, the new school year started. And so it's that kind of speed with which philanthropy can act to step into some of these capital gaps, um, financial capital gaps, but also the other kinds of capital that Kelly was talking about that are just so critical to the, the, um, the recovery and the reimagining um, of this from this uh, crisis. 
Let's see. Um, we've got an, a lit, and I encourage you if, you, if you click on the three little buttons in the chat box at the bottom next to where it says file, it'll say save the chat and it will save on your uh, desktop or somewhere on your computer um, so that you can see the links and access them later. Um, something I learned in one of these many Zoom, Zoom calls, but. Um, Oh, That's a really good tip. And yeah. <laughs> other questions or comments? Bonnie, Kelly, do you have any um, things you'd like to to oh, share? I, I have a question. It's it's uh, it's a, not a random question, but it's for Kara uh, because in taking like a trip down memory lane, um, I remember in Appalachia you had a campaign around "I am a child of Appalachia." Um, which I really thought was uh, ingenious. And I'm wondering if that has progressed to, uh, which I think is relevant for all rural communities, is people grew up in these communities and have a place in their heart. Um, and to call on them to uh, give back, to come back or to invest. Um, I'm just wondering, can you just do a little thumbnail on that? Yeah, I can. So. Um we talk about structural inequities. There also are cultural inequities where we sort of um, have low expectations for a variety of reasons. And so this really started as like a mindset campaign to share stories of success from our region so that we could envision success. And then it became a way to reach out to people who like Eli are from Appalachian, Ohio, but might be living somewhere else. And um, this year, our child of Appalachia honoree, among several, will be Joe Burrow, who just got the Heisman Trophy and remembered his home and the, you know, broke our hearts just talking about the need there. And it's actually evolving now, Kelly. So because we realized a lot of people didn't identify with child. They wanted to be an investor or a, a teacher or so on. But calling on people that have lived outside our area to give back has been um, fundamental to our success. And um, they've seen philanthropy at work in communities where they live now and find what we offer to be really unique. But I have grown to understand that they don't actually have to have been from Appalachian, Ohio to care, but it's, um, it's been just our brand and I'm so glad we have it. So thanks for, yeah. That's great. So, so I'll pose a um, pose a question, and, and and this this is going to feel like one of those um, those cosmic questions. But in our slides, we talked about if not you, who? If not now, when? Um, and I just wonder if any of you have have had experiences over the past few months that have just made made you really lean into the your your mission of centering both the community and also centering equity in the work that you're doing that you might want to be willing to share with us and you can just go off mute you don't have to type it into the chat box since we only have a few minutes left i can share just briefly i just got off my last meeting a about six months ago, we started an African American Community Foundation. So it's our first, um, not this county or that county. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's become something that we're really putting some resources to right now. Only probably 4% of our community really is, is African American, but it's a way to bring full participation as philanthropists and to uplift that voice into our work. So something. Sorry, Lucy seems to have all these answers for us. Right. <laughs> I meant to have it on mute earlier. I apologize. No, it's wonderful. <laughs> other other thoughts? Kelly, Bonnie, you can chime in too. <laughs> I, I just would point people to take a look at um, what Justin and uh, Mary Reynolds Babcock are doing around understanding power. Um, and power in place and, and, and our own power and privilege um, as institutions and um, thinking about who, who gets to make the decisions um, and, and where does, what, what role do we play or are we playing right now? Are we part of the, the problem or can we be part of the solution? And how do we 
uh, use our own power, share power, or cede it um, to the places that, that we say we um, love and want to see thrive. And, and I'll, I'll share one thing. We, we, we just finished up some work with a community foundation in um, California in the Modesto area, which is doesn't feel very rural, but from California, it feels, um, it feels pretty small town. Um, and they've been working to, to really bring partners together in their community before the crisis around inclusive economic development. They're a community of more than 50% um, people of color um, and really disproportionate impacts on people of color in terms of um, lower educational attainment and poverty and things like that. And when the crisis hit, they, because of the work they were do in, doing before and their, their willingness to, to sort of hold um, inclusive economic development as part of their mission, they had donors reach out to them to start a downtown small business fund that would benefit um, entrepreneurs of color in their community, not to the economic development folks, but to them. And they've had other folks, including economic development folks, come to them to say, this crisis is disproportionately affecting people of color. Help us figure out how we need to change the way we work. And, and, I, and it, to me, it was just a, an, an affirmation of their willingness to, to, to say we are about this community and this community is a diverse community and we're going to be inclusive. And it has given them the political capital, the reputational capital um, to, to do their community leadership work in a really significant way um, and to have the community recognize that. And so I think it's a, it, it is an important time. And I think, I mean, I'll just say again, if not place-based foundations like yours, community foundations and others, um, who is going to have that kind of voice and hold that, um, that center, if you will, of community for the long haul? Chitra, I think we're at Good four point. We are at time. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for those final comments. As uh, Deb mentioned, you can save the chat if you'd like. Otherwise, you will receive some links for this panel as well, or this uh, breakout group as well as all the other breakout groups in case you missed some content that you want to go back and listen to as well as the you will get a, um, a link for the main session as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was amazing. I just saw that we had over uh, we had about 415 people sign in to this webinar, uh, the bigger session and I know this session had at least 30 and uh, I think the conversation was really fantastic. Look forward to engaging with folks in the future on other events like this. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks to all of you. Thank you stay for our safe. great panelists. Yeah, stay safe. Thank you.